Hello and welcome to the Kerbal Space Center. Today's launch is a test of a suborbital rocket. If all goes as planned, the rocket will burn for about 8 or 9 seconds, reaching a speed of around 600 meters per second and an altitude of about 2400 meters at engine cutoff. After that, we're not really sure what will happen. Hopefully, Jeb will be okay. Are you ready, Jeb? All right, fantastic. A successful liftoff and test of the RT-5 solid rocket booster, also known as the FLEA. At approximately 8 or 9 seconds, we had engine cutoff with altitude at about 2,700 meters and a speed of around 650 meters per second. Now, I'm sure Jeb will be fine. In this video, we'll analyze the math and physics of those first 8 seconds of the flight. We'll begin that analysis with the observation from physics that change in momentum is the net force operating in a particular system. And so written mathematically, that is, the change in momentum over time, this is the derivative of the momentum. The momentum is the mass times the velocity. So the time rate of change of momentum is the net force F. During a rocket launch, the mass of the rocket and the velocity and the net forces are all changing uh, instantaneously and simultaneously. And so if we take a derivative of this mass times velocity, both mass and velocity are changing over time. So this is a product rule where we are indicating both of those derivatives in the uh, differentiation. And uh, so the mass changes over time uh, multiplied with the velocity this mass is also changing over time, uh, and we're multiplying by the change in the velocity over time. And we'll use the symbol r to represent, in this case, we'll just model the launch with a constant rocket thrust. That's the reason why I want to use that RT5 solid rocket booster. It burns pretty much constant. And in reality, even in the game, actually, it isn't perfectly constant, but it's pretty near constant. So I'm going to use a constant value for the thrust. Um, I also don't go terribly high, uh, and so I don't get that far away from the planet Kerbin. Uh, so I should just, yeah, this is actually the same acceleration near the planet Kerbin as it is near Earth, 9.8 meters per second squared. And since we don't get that far away from the planet Kerbin, uh, I'm going to assume that g, the constant acceleration near the surface of Kerbin, uh, I'll assume that's constant. In fact, actually, it does change a little bit, but not that much because we don't go that far away from the planet. So I'm going to take that to be a constant to simplify the mathematical model. Of course, the, the mass of the rocket definitely changes, and uh, I, will, I will include that in the, in the equation, but I'm going to take g to be a constant here. Of course, the velocity is changing significantly, and as it goes through the atmosphere, it produces a lot of drag, the air resistance. And I'm going to model that as something that is proportional to the square of that velocity. So I'll use this value k to represent this coefficient of drag. All right, so that is the one equation that describes that first eight or nine seconds uh, of the um, rocket burn. Perhaps in another video, I could continue after that finish, after the engine cut off and just take this r value and have it go to zero and then see what happens. And one other completely obvious point that I uh, almost missed was to make a comment about the fact that I've chosen uh, the motion to be just uh, vertical and the thrust to be a, f a positive in my uh, scale in the vertical scale so thrust is upward and both the weight and drag or op uh, operating or producing a force that is opposite to the direction of the thrust. So that's why both of these have a negative and why the R, the thrust, has a positive because I'll take positive to be up and a negative to be down in just a vertical scale uh, that describes uh, the, the motion and the changing velocities uh, on that, on that uh, simple vertical scale for the, for the, the change in the position. All right, so now let's take a look at this rocket that was launched, some of the particular details about this rocket. So as you can see down here, I have the stages, and the booster that I'm using has a thrust of about 162.9 kilonewtons, 
um, thrust to weight ratio of 6.7, starting mass at two, about 2.5 two tons and ending mass at about 1.4 tons and a burn time of about 9 seconds. That engine is right here, the RT5 Flea Solid Fuel bo Booster and we can see max thrust at sea level about 162.9 uh, kilonewtons in a vacuum it's 192 kilonewtons it gives me information here about the engine's ISP the sp specific impulse at sea level and in a vacuum and I may come back and look at that again s to see how far we get with this um, I don't particularly need that for the way that I set up the equation now here's another place where I can see some information about this particular rocket I have a starting mass of 2480 and that's measured in kilograms this was the mass without any fuel this is the total amount of uh, kilograms of uh, fuel that we have on board uh, but we'll end with about 1430 so we have an initial mass of 2480 kilograms, a final mass of 1430 kilograms for a difference of 1050 kilograms. Now when I first set up the math here, I assumed an 8 second burn, so I might be a little bit off, but I think it's pretty close. I took uh, 1050 kilograms divided by 8 seconds to get a burn rate of about 131.25 kilograms per second. Now, it's not even an exact constant burn rate, even in the game, but I think it leads to a pretty good approximation for the flight. In fact, I have a screenshot here where it's at 8 seconds and the fuel is, is gone, appears to be burnt out, and it doesn't seem like the engine is uh, firing at all. So I think it's not a full 9 seconds that it burns, somewhere between 8 and 9 seconds. One other observation to make is that the altitude is starting at 74 meters above sea level so that whatever distance we expect it to travel, we're going to add the 74 t to that to match it with what we record in the game or what we observe in the game. Okay, so that's it. We're modeling the velocity and height for the FLEA RT-5 solid rocket booster in the game Kerbal Space Program. And so we're going to solve the rocket equation with constant acceleration due to gravity and atmospheric drag that's proportional to the square of the velocity. So the first thing I did to solve this um, is I went to this uh, Wolfram Programming Lab uh, online. You can create a free account here and it's a really powerful tool. So I am solving the rocket equation with gravity and atmospheric drag. Launching from the ground, initial mass was 2480 kilograms. I'm going to take a mass burn rate of 131.25 kilograms per second and a burn time of 8 seconds with a thrust of 163,000 newtons. So the equation that I'm going to solve is laid out right here. This is the uh, change in the momentum uh, over time equal to the sum of all the forces. R is the thrust, M is the mass that change changes, G is the constant acceleration due to gravity, K is a coefficient of drag, V is the velocity, and this is a term that it, uh, uh, represents the increasing drag as it gets faster and faster. Now if the fuel is burned at a constant rate, then we can say that the mass starts at some initial mass and drops off at a constant rate given by this lambda. So over time you uh, get lambda would be this 131.25. So the change in mass over time is just negative 131.25. It's negative lambda. That's the derivative of the mass over time. And substituting that into the equation I have up here, I can rewrite the equation in this form. The mass is variable. The velocity, or this is the change in velocity over time, so it's actually the acceleration that describes the position. It's not the acceleration due to gravity. This is the acceleration of the object uh, of the rocket as it is influenced by both gravity and thrust and the uh, drag, the, the atmospheric drag. This is negative lambda times V, that just comes from substituting in uh, the change in mass over time is negative lambda. And there's the thrust minus, this is the variable mass, constant acceleration, and a term for drag. 
So let's set those variables to specific values that we found in the game. So in the game, near the surface of the planet uh, Kerbin, the acceleration due to gravity is just like it is on Earth. It's 9.8 meters per second squared. This is the coefficient of drag that I chose here, uh, 0.3. Now, of course, this is an experimental value, so ultimately what I really did was I looked at um, the mathematical model, chose a few different k values until I got something that fit right with what I observed in the game. So uh, after recording the rocket launch and choosing different values of k, I settled on a value that seemed to work to fit the data that I saw in the game. Now, depending on how you define this coefficient it is either a dimensionless value uh, or in if you're putting it in the equation as I've written it here it actually has uh, units you could you could identify the units of kilogram per meter and the reason for that uh, is following you see we could say this term kv squared represents the force due to the atmospheric drag on the rocket and the units of force are newtons and newtons are kilogram meters kilogram meters per second squared. So the units of K need to be kilogram per meter so that when you multiply that by uh, units of velocity, meters per second, that are squared, you end up with kilogram meter squared over meters times second squared and then a unit of meter cancels out. We have kilograms meters over second squared representing newtons. So this coefficient K isn't dimensionless it's a coefficient in the term that course you know that 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 represents the force and and it actually has units of kilograms per meter there's another coefficient that's often uh, part of these calculations of drag that would be dimensionless that's in part in the process of finding the value of k there is a dimensionless unit that's called a, also called a coefficient of friction um, that you know is experimental that, com that comes from the you know the shape uh, but this 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 involves uh, the uh, atmospheric pressure and the area, the cross-sectional area, uh, and um, and that uh, dimensionless coefficients all in this single value of k. Uh, in fact, it's even amazing in this Kerbal Space Program game, the atmospheric pressure actually changes during the flight, uh, but I didn't account for that. I just found a value that's uh, close, uh, you know, that, that seems to fit the data that, that I'm going to just take as a constant. Uh, so, okay, so that's that's where K comes from. That's what K uh, represents. That's why it has units of kilograms per meter. And I found a value of 0.3 works pretty well to fit the data that I see in the game. So there's lambda 131.25, initial mass 2480, uh, constant thrust, thrust at 163,000 newtons. Now I've typed in the differential equation into, uh, this is, Mathematica code, and it's spitting back how it interpreted that equation with an initial condition that the velocity at time zero is zero. And I want to store the solution to that differential equation. I'm solving for v, the velocity. I'm going to store it in this variable um, SOL <laughs> for solution. Uh, and it's uh, computing an a, a value on the interval from zero to nine. and uh, the reason I have to do this, this is a numerical differential equation solver. This is this here is a uh, first order nonlinear differential equation that I have no way that nobody can get an exact solution for this. Um, and so that's why I jumped right into solving it on Mathematica is to get a, a numerical solution. Uh, and so that's where it stores it in this thing that Mathematica, Mathematica calls an interpolating function. It's just a whole bunch of data points that I just ask the program to spit out in a table velocities at the first nine seconds and graph them. So there's the solution numerically for the velocity. So here I have recorded it in this middle column as the result from Mathematica. 
but I also did this calculation via Euler's method in Excel, and I'll show you that in a second, and I'm comparing it here with the values that I recorded in the game. So what happened is I just went through and froze the, I record, I, you know, recorded the video, and it just every second I just recorded uh, what the, just wrote it down on a piece of paper, you know, pause and, and, uh, and recorded speeds at, at different times. So it's sort of dropped off here at nine seconds compared to what the mathematical model, but I think it's somewhere between eight and nine seconds the engine cut off. And so that's why it's at about 652 meters per second as I recorded it here. Taking that data that I had in the table there and putting in Excel and plotting it in Excel. I got a really impressive result here. The graphs of the velocity over time. Solving the equation with Euler's method, that's the blue curve. With Mathematica, that's the orange curve. And the gray curve is the data that I recorded in the game. It's obviously a really good fit, and that's obviously really impressive, and that's what really uh, I wanted to share. So let's take a look at exactly how did I get the solution nu uh, numerically with Euler's method. Well, the principle of Euler's method is that you would start with some first-order differential equation like we have here, but in order to apply Euler's method, you want to solve for the derivative. So I've just divided this m naught minus lambda t underneath, and oh yeah, of course, I moved this term lambda v over to the other side and then divided by this uh, changing mass. Now Euler's method is basically uh, described by this equation right here. What has, what's happening is that you're essentially saying that the uh, value of the function, in this case it's the velocity, the solution, uh, the next value is based on what it was before plus the rate at which it's changing times some increment in the independent variable. In other words, you could think of this as whatever initial velocity you have plus the acceleration, that's the um, change in the velocity, so plus the acceleration times some increment in time. So if you look at how fast the um, velocity is changing over time, multiply by an increment of time and add to the previous velocity, you would have the subsequent following value for the velocity. That's the essence of Euler's method right there. When you want to find a solution numerically for, uh, for the function that you can describe in terms of a derivative, uh, you set it up this way. And we can put that in Excel. So I've put in the values that we had for the thrust and the initial mass, the burn rate, acceleration due to gravity, the drag coefficient, uh, and there again is a term involving the burn rate but uh, times the velocity because that's just how it was in the equation, all divided by that variable mass. I did an increment of one second because I tried it with smaller increments of time and it didn't really change, uh, it didn't make it more accurate. Uh, so I just, it was simple enough to just leave it at one second in increments. So I'm getting uh, a velocity over the first eight or nine seconds using this in Excel. So I'll show you what that looks like. So here in Excel I have uh, the differential equation just written up here so that I could remember what it was with my initial condition that the velocity at time zero was zero and I have the solution computed by Euler's method here and I'm just comparing it with the result in Mathematica in this second column. So this is just copied out of the output from Mathematica. So I did uh, nine increments, each increment representing uh, one second, um, which is the, the delta t, the change in time, or the step size in Euler's method. So here's my step size in this cell C2. So uh, this is just an initial condition. So there's, there's uh, both of these are just set to begin. But right here is where I'm actually typing in the uh, formula for Euler's method where I'm starting with the initial velocity or the previous velocity which actually is the initial velocity d7 right there that value and there's the thrust minus the well that's the initial mass and the burn rate and the acceleration to gravity etc there's the velocity uh, the previous velocity squared and basically that's it times I just kept it at a constant one there uh, and uh, as my delta t. So that then can be just copied down 
so that the next cell uses the value at, um, at the velocity at one second and the next cell uses the velocity at two seconds and it just extrapolates from there what the velocity would be uh, over time and at nine seconds according to Euler's method about 685 meters per second if it burned through the full nine seconds so I'm pretty confident that I put it into Excel accurately and correctly because I'm getting the same result that I did from Mathematica and they agree all the way through the nine seconds uh, the graph uh, really clearly uh, shows um, that they are very very similar curves okay and then after solving for the velocity with Euler's method and with Mathematica and comparing that with the velocities that I recorded in the game graphing those two curves comparing them seeing that I was pretty close I had a very accurate model mathematical description for the launch over the at least the first eight seconds or maybe nine seconds roughly uh, then I took that uh, data that came from Mathematica this is the output from Mathematica these are the velocities over the first eight seconds I just used the first eight seconds here up to in Mathematica where it was predicting about 612.5 meters per second for the velocity right there some at some point during second number eight so yep that's the data from Mathematica so I got a curve that is the curve of best fit a cubic curve fit really well on the interval from 0 to 8 seconds so I graphed that uh, plotted the data found the curve of best fit and I thought it'd be kind of interesting to then take that curve put it into a calculator and integrate that curve over the interval of 8 seconds to figure out what is the change in the uh, total change in the uh, in the position the total displacement by integrating the velocity I find the distance traveled so it's traveling about 2288.3 meters total during those eight seconds so um, it taking that initial height as about 74.7 meters that value I got as it's recorded in the Kerbal EDU mod for the game I found out a little bit more accurate that it was 74.7 .7 meters for the uh, altitude there at the launch pad and if I add on this total displacement 2288.3 I get about 2363 meters uh, altitude after 8 seconds and I recorded about 2374 at some point during that eight second uh, that uh, period of, uh, of the eight second of the flight here is a screenshot uh, at eight seconds where it's about 2374 meters traveling at about 613.6 meters per second here is still eight seconds and it's burned out the rocket is burned out and it's a little bit higher there at 2663 meters versus the 2374 so it's gone a few hundred meters there already just in that fraction of a second uh, but uh, yeah I'm pretty p pleased with that result it's uh, matching very closely what happened in the game so I think we have a very accurate mathematical model uh, for the, the launch of this solid rocket booster all right so we kinda left Jeb hanging up there uh, Let's just go back and check on how Jeb is doing.
Okay, that's it. Thank you very much for watching.